pray. Dear Father, we thank you for your kindness that you are uh, our living hope. I pray that as we think through what it means to counsel and to love others, that um, that idea of, of bringing people to their true hope would always be upon our hearts amidst the so many false hopes of this world that they would want to uh, turn to their Savior and uh, love him above all things. Uh, so we thank you, Father. We love you. We praise you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good evening. It is, it is good to be here. It's a grace uh, to be able to share with you. Uh, I really appreciate your faithfulness. Uh, I'm guessing for many of you, the day has already been a long one. I know some of you are fighting the traffic and the rain to get here. So I appreciate your willingness to be trained to continue to love those in your life that you're ministering to. This evening, we're going to finish our discussion on the process of change. And, and it's really not the end of the discussion, uh, because as we come back to the, the different facets of um, the process of counseling, we'll come back over and over to some of these ideas. Um, but we're finishing up kind of this immediate discussion of how people change. And, and needless to say, it's fundamental to counseling, because the Bible says that we're all in process. Right? Sanctification means that we are in this journey of becoming more and more like Christ. And the joy of the counselor, as we've often said, is we get the front row seat to grace. We, we get to see God move and work in people for their good and his glory. Now, as we think of the process of change, as we have said, it's a turning from sin and idolatry and unbelief and turning towards Christ in faith and love and worship. And again, like we've said, this is, it is fundamental to understanding people is this idea. Everyone is a worshiper. Every moment is a worship moment. And what we worship determines how we live. Okay, so I really want you to think about that. As, as you're counseling people, as you're, everyone's a worshiper. Every moment is a worship moment, and what they worship will determine how they live. If my kids misbehave, that is a worship moment. Will I worship comfort or obedience or respect, or will I worship Christ? Because what I worship will determine how I live. <clears throat> my spouse commits adultery. I lose my job. I don't get into the school of my dreams. An unbeliever asks me out on a date. I find out that my mother has cancer. A coworker stabs me in the back. Those are all worship moments. And again, what I worship will determine how I live. So again, uh, the process of change is a turning from the sin and idolatry and unbelief and a turning towards Christ in faith and love and worship. Now, last time, Pastor Tim discussed repentance, a turning from sin. And, and I, I hope you realize, again, how important this is because when, when people are unrepentant, sanctification comes to this grinding halt. Now, this doesn't mean that every counseling situation is, is only focused on sin, but if sin is being addressed, people will get stuck if they don't acknowledge their sin. For instance, if someone is struggling with sinful anger towards an, an unfaithful spouse, they'll get stuck and move deeper into bitterness if they don't acknowledge their anger is a sin against God. And this doesn't mean they weren't sinned against, but if they want to move towards a place of forgiveness and peace, then they must repent and turn from their sin. When I'm counseling, if, if I hear a lack of repentance then I know that change is kind of coming to this grinding halt. For instance, if I hear a wife say, well, I know I shouldn't get mad, but he does this. Right, that, that but is going to cause troubles. If they say, my looking at pornography doesn't really hurt anyone, my addiction is because of my genetics, that, I don't get angry with my, um, that if I don't get angry with my kids, they won't listen, that my laziness is because of how I was raised, then that change is going to come to this grinding halt. People must truly admit their sin and repent of it if change is going to happen. That being said, it's not only a turning from sin, because as we discussed, the question isn't if you will worship, but what you will worship. So if you don't turn um, from your idolatry to Christ, <clears throat> you'll simply turn to another idol. But know too that turning from, so, so turning from sin means you have to turn to Christ. He is the object of our focus. We've talked about this before, but remember, counseling is about showing Christ as worthy to be trusted, loved, and worshipped. You are helping others know Christ more deeply and accurately so that they would trust him more truly, love him more intensely, worship him exclusively, and live for him more faithfully. <clears throat> And for me, that's this kind of beautiful picture of what, what I want to do when I, when I meet with people. I'm not just trying to fix them or get them to change their behavior or to feel better. I want them to trust, love, and worship Jesus more. 
Okay, that is the end goal of, of all counseling. Now, with this in mind, it re- reveals one of the difficult difficulties of counseling. It's the belief by those that we counsel that obedience is right, but it's not necessarily better. All right, let's be honest. Sin often seems better. The world, they get to enjoy money and sex and entertainment with no constraints. They get to seek power and pleasure and popularity and prestige with no guilt trips. What do Christians get? We get to love our enemies. We get to be generous with what we have. We get to give our money away. We get to display patience. We get to forgive those who hurt us. We get to serve in the church. We get to share the gospel with people who don't want to hear it. I could go on and on. That's kind of a hard sell, right? To me, when I was younger, I thought of obedience like exercise. Exercise is right, but it's not better. Um, Believe it or not, I I do exercise some. I run a bit. And you know what? I hate it, right? I hate running. It's mostly pain and heavy breathing. And and, and to be honest, I don't understand people like my wife who love to run. Have you ever talked to those people that talk about the runner's high, which I don't don't know if that really exists. I'm, I'm not convinced. Um, but not only do I hate running, I actually try to convince my wife, again, who loves running, that running is terrible. Um, I'm like an evangelist for not running. In the past, we've, we've gone jogging, and my argument to her is that as we're jogging, no one looks like they're having fun. Okay, like, go jogging, and so I'll literally point out the fact that no one's smiling. Like, look at that, they're miserable. So we're jogging, oh, that person, look how sad they look. And even if she finds someone who is kind of smiling, I'll just say, well, something's obviously wrong with them. That makes sense. That all being said, I run. Why? Not because it's better. You know, sitting on my couch seems better. Watching a ball game, eating pizza seems better. I do it because it's right. And I think this is often our view of sin and obedience. Obedience is right, but it's not better. It seems better to be selfish with our money, to not feel guilty about hating a coworker, uh, to be complacent in our evangelism, to pursue pleasure, um, pleasure and substances, to be lazy in our serving. But... We have to do what's right. But this isn't true. Right? This is the world's lie. Sin isn't better. Jesus is better. So get that. Jesus isn't just right. He is better. He offers greater and more enduring joy. And this then is at the heart of, of gospel-centered counseling. It's giving people something greater to worship and trust in. So the hope isn't just that, that they see Jesus as right, but that he's better. Does that make sense? You're walking with someone, and you're not just telling them, hey, you need to obey. You're trying to convince them that Jesus is better. Again, it's not enough to just stop worshiping an idol, because we will always worship. And if it isn't one idol, then it will be another. So we must encourage them to worship Jesus above all things. As I read before, one of of my professors would say this, we need to push out inferior worship with superior worship. He says, these are our strongest weapons against strong desires. Superior loves, hopes, and trusts defeat inferior loves, hopes, and trust. Does that make sense? If we want people to stop worshiping idols, we need to give them something better to worship, namely Jesus the Christ. So the idea is that we turn from sin and we turn towards Christ. Like I mentioned last time, I've heard so many caricatures of biblical counseling You just read them a verse, you just point out their sin, you just have memorized scripture. But understand that at its heart is to have people worship and love Christ above all things, to be so satisfied in him that they don't seek satisfaction elsewhere. So practically, how do we do this? Because the concept is pretty simple. We need to trust Jesus more, and we need to worship Jesus more. But as simple as it is to understand, it can be difficult to really practically apply. I mean, even as I say this, it may sound impractical. Like, do you want to overcome your lifelong battle with pride? You just need to love and trust Jesus. Your marriage is in shambles. You're on the brink of divorce. You just need to love and trust Jesus more. That's the answer. You're addicted. You just need to love and trust Jesus. Okay, so it sounds impractical. Now, to break through what is seemingly impractical idea, we must remember, as we've discussed, the heart is always doing a couple of things. It is believing and it is worshiping. So as those you are counseling are interpreting and responding to life, it's again rooted in two ideas. People live out, uh, live based on their worldview, what they believe, and they live based on their worship. Now as we've discussed, these ideas are intimately intertwined with faith and desire being at the heart of worship. But for practical purposes this evening, we're going to focus on faith and worship. 
as it says in your notes, since people are interpreting life and responding to life and living life based on what they believe and what they worship, I must speak to their faith and their worship. Specifically, we need to correct and build up faith, and we need to encourage and fuel worship. And so that's what we're going to look at this session. How do we correct and build up faith, and how do we encourage and fuel worship? So again, last time it was turning from sin, now we're turning towards Christ. So let's look at those two ideas in more detail. The first is this, we need to correct and build up faith in Christ. If people live based on what they believe, then I need to speak to what they believe. Again, I need to correct and build up faith. I have uh, four kids. I don't remember any of them believing in monsters. But a couple of years ago, one of them had trouble sleeping because uh, they saw the poster for the movie It. I don't know. Uh, I didn't see it, nor did, nor did he. But apparently it's about a supernatural murderous clown. And so he's not afraid of monsters, but as he told me, clowns are straight up scary. So now if you believe that there are supernatural killer clowns, that is really frightening. I mean, if I actually believed that there were these supernatural killer clowns in this world, I would have trouble sleeping, right? His faith, his belief led to his fear. So what do I do? Buy an alarm system? Do I just tell him, hey, you just got to stop being afraid? For me to speak to his heart, I speak to what he believes. Like part of it would be there are no supernatural killer clowns. I use the term um, correct their faith because the problem isn't whether or not people have faith. Everyone has faith, but often it is an incorrect faith. Again, if you believe in these clowns, so I don't just tell them, you can't believe, um, uh, I'm, again, my, think of, of my son who believes in, in killer clowns. I don't tell him, you can believe whatever you want to believe, or you just have to have faith. He has faith. He has faith in killer clowns. So I correct his faith. There are no clowns. But I don't just tell him they don't exist. I don't just correct his belief system. I build it up. So not only do I tell him supernatural clowns don't exist, I tell him about Jesus, right? And what it means that we have a God who, who watches over him and never sleeps, a God who loves him, a God that we can trust, and that we don't have to, and because of that, we don't have to fear. Let me give you a more common example, since that's probably not your counseling someone who believes in clowns. If someone says, my life is spiraling out of control, Understand they're expressing their feelings, but they're also expressing their worldview, how they understand their situation. They have this insufficient understanding of God's sovereignty and love and wisdom. They are not embracing what it means that their life is very much in control of a loving and wise God. And so to help them out, we must encourage them to know better the sovereign grace of our Lord. In other words, we have to help correct and build up their faith. Now, faith seems nebulous. Imagine I told you, you just have to have more faith. What would you do? Uh, I mean, we get the importance of it, but how do I just have more faith? Some treat it like uh, a supernatural entity, like, uh, or it seems like some version of spiritual willpower. I just need to try harder to trust God. But what do we do? Now, on one hand, faith is a gift of God. It's a product of grace. That is why one of the things you should most Constant, consistently be doing is praying for our faith. So one simple application is to pray that those who are ministering would tr- that you're ministering to would trust God. I mean, because faith is a gift from God. But practically, the way we address it is through thinking. Okay, so we help people trust more through thinking. Have you ever heard someone say, "You're thinking too much. You just have to trust God." It's true that we may be thinking wrongly. But we have to kind of get rid of that unbiblical notion of blind faith. The Bible doesn't commend blind faith. In fact, when the Bible encourages faith, it gives truth about God to build up faith. Does that make sense? In John 14, 1, Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. Okay, so don't, don't fear, don't worry. Believe in God, believe also in me. But he doesn't end there. He doesn't say, hey, just trust God. He then talks about himself and why they should believe in him, including the famous, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In other words, he tells them to have faith in him, and then he gives them reasons to have faith in him. So as you're building someone's faith, you're giving them reasons to trust in God. 
Let me give you another example of Jesus showing uh, that faith uh, is intimately tied to our thinking. Uh, If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 6. Here Jesus describes faith as thinking. Okay, the idea being the more you understand God, the greater your faith will be. Now in the passage, it's concerned, uh, Jesus is concerned about their faith. In verse 30, he says, oh, you of little faith. Remember, they're struggling with anxiety. They're worried about well, where they will get their next meal. Okay, so this is a passage on faith. They need to trust God. Um, and yet as Jesus encourages them, he doesn't tell them, you just need to have faith. Or he doesn't offer some vague notion of belief. He encourages them to think. Right? He tells them to look at the birds of the air and the flowers of the field and how God takes care of them. And then he says, consider. Or we might say, think. Verse 28. So he's using a visual aid to get them to think. The point being, if they want to grow in faith, they need to consider who God really is and why they can trust him. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this. Faith, according to our Lord's teaching in this verse, is primarily thinking. And the whole trouble with the man of little faith is that he does not think. He allows circumstances to bludgeon him. Christian faith is essentially thinking. Look at the birds. Think about them. Draw your deductions. Look at the grass. Look at the lilies of the field. Consider them. So again, see the big picture. Jesus knows they have little faith. But he doesn't tell them, you just have to have more faith. He reveals to them their God, the God they should trust in. He wants them to know him better, that they might trust him better. Romans 12.2 is another great example. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so understand that as we encourage people to think rightly, it is for the purpose of right faith and right love and right worship. All that to say, as you consider counseling someone and they're struggling in some way, you're trying to help them to think better. The way that we describe it is there are holes in their theology and their worldview. They understand something incorrectly. Their understanding of who Christ is and um, who they are falls short in some way. And so you must help them to have a better worldview, a better faith. In your notes, I wrote the goal. And it's determined the holes in someone's theology incorrect and or insufficient understanding about God in this world, and then correct and build up their faith and worldview. So one of the reasons that this is practically helpful is because it offers clear teaching points. I think of all the things you do in counseling, teaching is one of the hardest to do, right? I feel like I can listen, I can grow in love, I can serve, but what do I say that's actually going to bring about change in their life? But if I really understand what someone believes, I have a clear entry point to teach them. Let's look at some examples. If someone generally has fear, like they struggle with fear, that's kind of hard to counsel. But what I really want to know is what they believe so that I can speak clearly. Are you afraid to die by the hand of a a supernatural killer clown? I can tell you what the Bible says. Think of these specific fears. I'm afraid to share my faith because people will look down upon me. I'm afraid to die because I'm not sure God will really forgive all my sins. I'm afraid of being alone. I'm afraid of losing my job because I won't have enough money. As I know what they believe and what they're fearful of, I have a clear clear lesson to teach them and to bring them to Christ. We'll come back to this idea later when we talk about teaching. But understand, we're looking for clear teaching points. So back to the previous example, someone is struggling with with, um, singleness because they're afraid of being alone. Generally, fear, again, can be hard to counsel. But if I specifically know they're afraid of being alone, I can teach them what the Bible says about that, about a God who is ever-present, what a relationship with God really is, what it means to know his infinite love. I could teach teach that person about the church, how that is our forever family, that it's not simply about hearing sermons and serving a little, but we do life together, rejoicing and weeping with one another. We could go on and on, but do you see my point? I'm not simply looking up verses on fear. I'm getting to the belief system behind their fear, and I'm speaking uh, truth from God's scripture into that. Back to the bigger idea. I want to know what someone believes, and I want to, to correct and build up their faith. 
Okay, so I want, I want to know what they believe and I want to correct and build up their faith. Now, there's a lot of ways that we could think through this. I mean, because basically, this covers everything in the world, every struggle, every difficulty, every joy. Uh, but for organizational purposes, I think there are three areas to build their faith up and, and correct their worldview. Think, inward, think upward, inward, and outward. What they believe about God, themselves, and their world. Again, as, I, as I'm, I'm thinking, as I'm helping people to think better, I'm helping them to think biblically. Uh, as I'm helping them to think biblically, I'm addressing what they believe about God, what they believe about themselves, and what they believe about the world they live in. As I put it up, in, put in your notes upward, this is God. Help them to know better the God they need to trust in. Inward, ourselves, give them a Christ-centered identity. And outward, circumstances and people offer a deeper or more practical theology of their world. <clears throat> So hopefully that makes sense. I want them to know better God, themselves, and the world in light of who Christ is. So let's look at th those ideas a bit closer. And again, we're just going to touch the surface. I mean, this is the, your, your lifelong study of God's word comes out in these ideas. The more you know about God, the more you can teach about God. Right? The more you know about a Christ-centered identity, the more you can teach about that. So we'll just touch on a few ideas, but hopefully at least give you some places to start. So the first one, A, a there is upward God. Help them to know better the God they need to trust in. We talked about this in our first session, but, but faith in Christ is the answer. Lost your job, you need to trust in Jesus. Struggling with your spouse, you need to trust in Jesus. Ministry difficulty, you need to trust Jesus. But like we said, people often have trouble trusting God because they have a, such a malnourished understanding of the God they should trust in. Because they don't know God, they don't trust him. Imagine some guy comes up off the street and says, can I borrow $100? Now, they could be a very trustworthy person, but because I don't know them, I don't trust them. I know many of you, you could ask me, um, and I would, I, would, I would lend you the money. I would trust you. So now I'm waiting to see who does this after, after I preach, but I would trust you. And I think the same is true for God. If someone is having trouble trusting God, I mean, you could turn to something like Psalm 34 and say, trust God because he is faithful, and that would be very true. But if this is the extent to which you've explained the faithfulness of God, you give them kind of this anemic understanding of God, and so logically, their faith will be anemic as well. And so the goal is to determine, again, the holes in someone's theology, incorrect, insufficient understanding of God, and then correct and build up their faith in him. For example, someone says, I feel like God doesn't care. My life is spinning out of control. If God loved me, then he would answer my prayers. How can cancer possibly be a good plan for my mother? I know divorce is wrong, but God wants me to be happy. Just one more time won't hurt anyone. Okay, there's, there's holes here, holes in their theology that affect how they understand and live life. So let me give you one example that comes up a lot in the counseling I do, especially for those who are suffering. And it's seeing our lives through the lens of God's sovereignty, wisdom, and love. One book I would recommend that you could read in terms of this is Trusting God by Jerry Bridges. He does a, a good job of looking at that triad, Trusting God by Jerry Bridges. So understand, I can only make sense of what I'm going through if I see it through the lens of God's sovereignty, love, and wisdom. So the problem isn't suffering in and of itself. As, we discuss later, as we'll discuss later on in the class, suffering has a purpose in God's sovereign grace. I mean, that's why the Bible can say, count it all joy when we meet trials of various kinds. What often makes it difficult then is that people often struggle to trust God's sovereignty, love, and wisdom when they're suffering. So maybe they struggle to trust that God is sovereign. They don't believe that he's actually in control. They believe God's hands are tied because of human freedom or something along those lines. Or they struggle with God's wisdom. They're convinced that they know what's best for their own lives and they cannot fathom God's plan for suffering is truly best. They think, what, what, what good is, is a rebellious child or, or, or a losing a job or chronic pain? Or they doubt God's love. They have trouble believing that God really cares for them. After all, in their mind, if, if he did, they wouldn't be suffering or he would be answering their prayers. So in all this, there, there's holes in their understanding about God. They don't get him in some way. Their view of him is incorrect or insufficient. So if you're going to help them... <clears throat> You need to build up their faith and correct their worldview. Maybe it would be to help them better understand the powerful sovereignty of God. 
the one who orders all of life according to his plan. Think of a, of a difficulty that you're going through right now, just a suffering or, or maybe a suffering of someone that you know. And then you think of a verse like Ephesians 1.11, talks about God, the one who works all things according to the counsel of his will. He works all things according to the counsel of his, his will. God is always in control. He is never not in control. And this should bring us comfort because it means that nothing is outside of God's plan. In one of the first sessions, I read of a public figure who lost her son in a tragic accident. And she said, not only did God not protect him, the wind blew him off, blew him from the road. The hand of God blew him from the road. So I had to think, what kind of God do I have that doesn't intervene? In fact, may even participate in the death of a good boy. And I, I, ta- um, I talk about in the book that I had to accept that my God was a God who brings enlightenment and salvation, and that's all. He doesn't promise us protection. Now, in her mind, it's, it kind of brings her a little bit of comfort because she thinks she's absolved God. Right? He's not at fault here. But understand, there is little comfort in knowing that things can happen to you that God does not plan. I mean, think about that for a moment. Is anyone safe? Is there any hope? Does life have any purpose if God is not in control? So again, as we're, as we're walking with people, we're helping them believe the sovereignty of God. It doesn't mean we always understand every purpose, but we absolutely trust that he's in control. Or maybe we have to help someone better understand God's wisdom. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heaven... As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. One, people, one mistake people often make is to be absolutely convinced that they know what's best for their life. But understand the conclusion must then be God doesn't know what is best. And admittedly, it's hard to understand why financial difficulties or broken relationships or sickness are wise. But we have to trust God. One example I often use in counseling is the example of the cross. Think about when Jesus was crucified. At the time, no one saw the cross and thought, this is a great idea. Like, I'm going to wear that as a little piece of jewelry around my neck because that's so important to me. At the time, um, uh, this only seemed like a tragedy. His disciples lost hope. His followers abandoned him. The person they thought to me, the Messiah, was then uh, hanging dead on a cross like a criminal. But in the midst of the greatest sin ever committed, the murder of Jesus, we find the most important event in human history, the salvation of sinners. And it is a reminder that God's wisdom is infinitely beyond ours. And so amidst tragedy, we should trust that there is grace. And I'll often ask people, like, if God can use the greatest tragedy in history for the greatest good, can he use your suffering for good? And so we have, to believe, we have to believe that this is how wise God is. And so again, as I'm, as I'm counseling people, I'm not just telling them, yeah, you know, maybe something's going on here. No, we believe in a God who is infinitely wise. And there is much going on. And, and I'll tell them, hey, you'll probably get glimpses of it. In a few weeks, you'll learn a little bit more. On the other side of eternity, when all is made known, you're going to see this remarkably beautiful plan come, come to, that came to pass. Or think about his love. Understand, even though God's love is the first lesson you learn in church, right? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It is a doctrine that is absolutely transforming. In Ephesians 3.19, it says that God's love surpasses knowledge. Okay, so it's bigger than our head. So understand, when it comes to the love of God, we are wading in the shallow end of the pool of that doctrine. And every step we take towards the deep end, we just realize how unfathomable this doctrine is and how for all of eternity we'll wade deeper and deeper into the pool and never reach its end, only gain a better understanding of how immeasurable the reality of his love is. I mean, think about that. When you die and you see Christ, you will still be learning about the love of God forever. And practically then, God's love is meant to be a lens through which I see my world. Christ's unfathomable love means that nothing can pass into your life that hasn't first passed through the filter of his love. 
For those of you at Lighthouse, you've heard me say that so many times. Your difficult coworker, your atheist professor, your unruly two-year-old, your unsaved spouse, your intrusive in-laws, your financial difficulties, your chronic health issues, they are all aspects of God's very unique love. And like we keep saying, this doesn't mean we understand what he's doing or that we necessarily have to enjoy suffering. But it does mean we live every moment convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And so if he has chosen to bring suffering, it has to be for our good. Theologically, there's no other way around it. Otherwise, what we're saying is that God kind of loves us or sometimes loves us, but there are things that, pass through, that get past his, his watch, these unloving things that come into our life. But that's not what the Bible tells us. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. He's using them in some way to accomplish his loving purpose in your life. Your trial is God loving you. Now, in, in the context like this, I can just throw this out there. I don't know what a lot of you guys are suffering through. And then, so maybe it sounds a little bit, maybe a little bit cold. I don't know. And so when you're sitting with someone, that's not what you lead with. I mean, if someone, if someone loses someone they love, a child, or, and, and you're, you just weep with them. And I've done that with some of you. You, you just weep and, and you, you hurt and you pray. But at some point, you need to bring them to the God who is loving, to know that he cares for them so much more than you care for them, so much more than they even love themselves. So now think about how growing in a knowledge of that love would encourage faith. It would mean that, that, that people would recognize, like I said, that nothing's passed in their life that hasn't pers- that passed through the filter of God's love. And so whatever suffering they are going through, it's God's grace. And he's going to accomplish something great in them so that he might do a good work through them. Again, just the tip of the iceberg. A while back, I was counseling a pastor from another church that was struggling with depression over health issues, ministry difficulties. I started talking about the love of God. He said, yeah, yeah, I know God loves me. And you can imagine he's preached sermons on God's love. He's a pastor. But as we started to really discuss it and just started to wade deeper into that pool, his eyes were, were open to the stunning nature of God's love, to even think of his trials within the context of love. It really changed everything for him. Now, putting these ideas together, seeing our lives through the the lens of God's sovereignty and wisdom and love, it means that I may not understand fully my suffering, but because I understand God, everything's changed. I know my suffering is part of God's wise and loving plan for my life. His love means he can only pursue my good, even if through painful means. Think about our fictional case study. Okay, so if you've been with us, we've been looking at stressed out Sally. Remember, she's struggling with anxiety in response to all the pressures of life. But imagine for a moment that she believed that all that was happening was part of God's wise and loving plan. Imagine she believed that God was uniquely loving her in her singleness, in her financial difficulties. It would, it would change everything. It would mean that she would understand that if marriage was better, she would be married. But because she is single, this must be part of God's loving, beautiful, mysterious, grace-filled plan for her life. She would believe that God is offering her greater joy, more opportunities to serve, more ways to grow in Christ-likeness. And so for her, you're correcting her whole, the holes in her theology, what she believes about God. For me personally, one of the most fundamental truths I remind myself of in difficulties is that this is God loving me. That this is God usually rescuing me from my own sin. Right? Difficult people reveal to me my selfishness. Aging reveals my dependence. Busyness reveals my people pleasing. And so in each of these difficulties, it's God loving me through that challenge and rescuing me from the sin that endangers my heart. And sometimes I'll just remind myself like, Lord, this is you loving me. This difficult person is you loving me. Back to the point, this is this is where I start with, with a counselee, helping them to know better the God they're supposed to trust in, and then orienting their lives around that. Think about someone that you're counseling, formally, informally. What do they believe or not believe about God? And how can you correct and build up their worldview? All right, point number B. Point number B, point letter B. Inward, ourselves, give them a Christ-centered identity. Again, huge topic. So we can't do a full treatment here, but understand how important identity is to how someone lives. 
like we said, our, our faith is fundamental to how we interpret and live life and so our identity is fundamental to, uh, to how we interpret and live life because it's a crucial part of our belief system. Does it make sense? What I believe of myself will affect how I understand my world. And understand, all of us have an identity. We all see ourselves in some way. For some, the most defining truth about them is that they are a spouse of someone or a student or an athlete or an engineer or a pa- parent or a pastor. Maybe you define yourself by a past sin. I'm a victim. I'm an addict. I'm a loner. I'm an abuser. The problem is that we were never made to define ourselves first according to the creation, but to the creator, right? If understanding our identity, if we understand our identity according to the creation, it means we see ourselves according to the world standards, what we look like, how successful we are, what we have, our relationships, the job that we do. For example, picture the person whose identity is as a a successful businessman, and then he loses his job and he has trouble getting another one. You can imagine the devastation because his meaning and worth, even his personhood, are tied to what he does. And since he feels like a failure in that area, he struggles with life. So as we, have to, so as we understand identity, we have to help people think about who they really are. And it's important for us to remember that our identity isn't discovered or understood in a vacuum. Rather, our identity is always in relation to, to something or someone, which means that in the absence of an identity centered on Christ, we'll find it elsewhere. Remember, we are always living out some identity. So if we forget who we truly are in the gospel, we will fill it, that lost identity with something else. Timothy Lane writes, and it's about how people change Each of us lives out some sense of identity. And our gospel identity amnesia will always lead to some form of identity replacement. That is, if who I am in Christ does not shape the way that I think about myself and the things I face, then I will live out some other identity. Let me give you some examples of identity replacements. I am my success. This is the person who finds their identity in worldly achievements. Think of the person who wants to be admired for what they have or what they wear or the car they drive or the points they score or the grades they get or the promotion they receive or the achievements of their kids. I am my occupation. This is the person who finds their identity in what they do. Think of the person who relishes in job titles, who overworks because they define themselves by their, by their work. I am my relationships. This is the person who finds their identity in love, the love, affection, and admiration of others. The person who has to have a significant other, the the one who fears um, their spouse, the one who's consumed with fitting in with their peers, the one who's afraid to share their faith because of what people will think. I am my appearance. This is the people who find their identity in what they look like. I am my sin. This is the person who, who sees themselves according to their sin. I'm an adulterer. I'm a warrior. I'm angry. I'm an angry person. We go on and on, but I'm, I'm my circumstances, I'm my ethnicity, I'm my possessions. Now imagine if you really believe those things, and then those idolatries, those identities are, are attacked by the world, by sin, by circumstances. How are you going to respond? The solution is we have to help people find their identity in Christ. Think about Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. In this passage, Paul doesn't say that the real you is your accomplishments or the fact that you're married or if you live in a certain zip code. If you're a Christian, the real you is defined by the gospel. Let me read to you Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Okay, so if you're if you're if you're part of Lighthouse, you know that this would take a long time for us to get through. So we can't really focus on the whole thing. But the one word I want you to think about is this idea of adoption. I think often when we think of the purpose of the gospel, we think things like forgiveness or getting saved from hell or getting into heaven. But Paul says that from the foundation of the world, there was a plan for adoption. That is what Paul says about who you are. You are a child of God. Right? He has moved all of life in, uh, in part to this end 
to adopt you. I think because uh, adoption is, is part of our family, you know, when our youngest son is adopted, it makes sense to me, this idea of what it means. Like, it's not like we have our, we have our biological kids and then we have this other one and, you know, we kind of like him, but we put up with him. It's like, for us, we don't, ever th- we don't think like that. Like, oh, there's, th- he's just our son. You know, we, we travel, we spend money, we went all this, cause, and we got him, and he's our son now. And imagine this is what God did, not just to, like, kind of, you know, pay some money. He, I mean, he sent his only son to make you his child. I mean, because of our sins, we are enemies. I mean, we lose our right to be children. And so in order to adopt us, God sent his son. And then Jesus, the, the one rightful heir of God the Father, the one true eternal son, became an orphan for us. He was literally forsaken by his own father to bring us forgiveness and grant us adoption. This is what Jesus was doing on the cross, not simply suffering physical pain and death, but he is suffering God's wrath in our place. The very son of God, forsaken by the father, so that we would never have to be. So that we would have a father in heaven. So think about that for a moment. The gospel is about making us his children again. That is who you are. Back to our discussion of identity. When we think of identity, we often think of the question, who am I? And by that we mean, like, what do I do? Who am I with? What do I have? But Paul has changed the question of identity from who am I to whose am I? And this pastor says we are God's. We're his children. Salvation is more than a clean slate. We receive the love of the triune God. We are given a present and future inheritance, and we will spend eternity with our Heavenly Father. Why is this important? Because my identity is in what I am, is that I am God's. As it says in your notes, finding our identity in Christ means we define ourselves vertically according to the Creator before we ever define ourselves horizontally according to the creation. Now, again, this is a big concept, but let's look at at least three ways your identity is transformed through adoption. Uh, The hope being that we can encourage those you counsel to really understand who they are in Christ. First, adoption means my identity is no longer tied to other people. Let me ask you, if we are children of the God of this universe, why would we ever try to find a greater identity in the world? Why is it often so important to have people like us or admire us, or bless us in some way. And part has to do with the fact that we desire acceptance, we fear rejection. I mean, remember, we were created to find all we need in in God, and thus have the capacity to love others, uh, sacrificially and selfishly. But sin turns the love that was meant to go upward to God, and overflow outward towards others, and turns it inward to ourselves. Until we become the greatest object of our own affection, which means that no longer are people an opportunity to give, but it means to receive. Okay, so all of a sudden, the sinfulness of our hearts means that we can't simply love people. We need people. We need people to like us or approve of us or think well of us or serve us or make our lives better. We don't love people for their benefit and the glory of God. We love people so that we'll be loved. And that's why so much of our identity is about achieving or increasing or protecting people's love and acceptance of us. So here's the the blessing of being adopted in God's family. We are loved and accepted by God through the gospel of Jesus. And our our adoption should dramatically change our lives because it means that we are no longer, we no longer need to learn people's love and acceptance. Rather, we we can rest in the love and acceptance of God our Father that we receive through Jesus. It doesn't ultimately matter what people think of me. I don't have to live up to their expectations. I can disregard the world's understanding of excess. Success. God loves me and accepts me through Jesus. Why would I ever settle for anything less? I remember one time counseling a lady who was uh, suffering pretty severe anxiety over financial issues. And the thing was, financially, they were, they were fine. I mean, they weren't in danger of not eating or, or being on the street. Um, but she was really worried about what her parents were thought because they'd already questioned the person they'd married, maybe because he didn't make enough money, and, and they were now considering downsizing and she was just so stressed, she wasn't sleeping. So what helped her is to remember that she wasn't defined by what her parents thought of her. Like she, she, she could just love them. 
Uh, she didn't need them to accept her or approve of her or approve of her husband. She didn't have to worry about the zip code they lived in or the size of their house to earn her parents' affection. And the reality is she may have had to do that to earn their affection. But what really mattered was who she was with God. It's a matter that she was defined by what Christ did for her, not what her parents thought of her. And in that, she was just free. You know, to trust that God's financial plan for her family was best. Imagine you're counseling Sally. She needs to remember who she is. As you read through her case study, her identity is tied to her boss, what her boss thinks of her, what her parents think of her, her singleness, her money. But she needs to realize that she's defined by what God thinks of her, and she, uh, he sees her as her daughter. Just as a side note, for those of your parents, I think I understand one of the most fundamental challenges we face is that our kids are constantly in danger of defining themselves by what people think of them. That's why they give in to peer pressure, why they need to have the latest and greatest to fit in, why they will disobey if your opinion differs from their friends' opinions. But we need to teach them and shepherd them to know that they are not defined by others, but by who they are in Christ. Not by what they have accomplished, but what Christ has accomplished for them on the cross. So adoption means my identity is no longer tied to other people. Second, adoption means my identity is no longer tied to my shame. Again, huge topic, but, but often we let our shame define us. For example, some people see their identity as some sin. It's maybe what brings the most shame, their scarlet letter. They are divorced. They struggle with same-sex attraction. They lose it with their kids. They are addicted. Now, in one sense, we should feel shame and conviction over our sin. We should hate it. We should feel bad over it. But understand, the cross does not leave us there because it deals with our guilt, which deals with our shame. As Kevin DeYoung says, when, when Christ forgives our real sin and takes care of, I'm sorry, Christ forgives our real sin and takes care of our real, um, our objective guilt, the root of shame is severed at its very source. Or maybe it's not your sin. Maybe it's the shame of some sin committed against you. Your shame is that you're abused or hurt in some way. We kind of see this in Jesus' crucifixion, where though he was perfect, shame was heaped upon him. In fact, as you read the crucifixion accounts, much more time is spent on the mockery and the shame being poured upon him than the physical pain of the cross. Some of those you counsel will know intimately what it means to be sinned against, and it has caused them to feel shame. They had parents who never demonstrated love, a spouse that cheated on them or left them, in-laws who spoke cruelly to them, maybe the ultimate betrayal of abuse or even rape. And this feels like their shame. It seems so much of who they are. It defines them. It's almost like their truest identity. But again, the gospel rids us of our shame and, and transforms our identity. I mean, first, simply remember that Jesus was the subject of shame that was not deserved. Isaiah 53 describes him this way. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. And not only was he abandoned by those he loved, but his own father with whom he had an eternally perfect relationship would forsake him. So we know Jesus understands this, this at least picture of shame. But second, the gospel frees you. You don't have to feel that shame. You don't have to let it define you. Instead, one is you trust in the justice of God and the truth that no one gets away with sin. Whether in hell or on the cross, every sin is dealt with in the severest of ways. Every sin committed against you or committed against those that you counsel has been or will be dealt with by God. And knowing this, you can be like Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Despising here means to think little of. Why? Because of the joy ahead. And this is us. We, we run the race. We look to the ultimate joy that we, will know when we, when we, that we will know when we come before Christ on that great day of glory. I mean, as Christians, there is joy to be found now, but one day, every bit of hurt we've experienced, every horrible memory, every lingering pain will be done away with as we know the unparalleled and unfathomable joy of knowing our Heavenly Father fully. And this is what we're telling people. You're not defined by the sin committed against you. 
Third idea is adoption means my identity is no longer tied to this world. Right? One of the things adoption says is this world is not our home. And one time we were, um, we had driven up to Canada because we were going to go watch Women's World Cup. And as we're crossing the border, I don't know why I'm nervous crossing the border. I, have, I don't have anything illegal with me. But just like, you know, people are asking questions and we get there and, and the guy's like, well, why, why are you here? And I'm like, well, we're just visiting. We're going to watch soccer. And my son from the back says, we just moved here. I'm like, why, why are you saying this? I'm like, you can keep him, right? The rest of us will go through. But when you're visiting someplace, right, when, when we're in Canada, we're, we're, not, we're not looking for property. I'm not trying to find a home. I'm, I'm just a visitor. And this is how we have to understand our, our, ourselves in terms of this world. We are just visitors. As Paul is describing himself and the Ephesian Christians, and really all believers, he reminds them to look forward. Right in Ephesians 1.11, he says, In him we have obtained an inheritance that is so sure that it's described as if we have already have it. And yet, on the other hand, we look forward to one day acquiring it. We have to understand that this life is not all that there is. We have a, a heavenly home that is far greater than we can possibly imagine, which means our identity can't be wrapped up in this world. And our culture's idea of success and security and joy. We are sojourners, visitors here on earth, simply passing through on the way to our eternal home. And since we are visitors, much of what we do has the potential of being worth very little in light of eternity. At our church, we counsel people struggling with finances, with body image issues, failed relationships, those who are depressed over some worldly failure or discouraged over a ministry that isn't growing or hopeless because of their singleness. But in this, we, we forget that being God's children means that, that, that we are not defined by this world and its understanding of success and failure or fortune or misfortune or achievement or loss. We are God's children, those who have an inheritance waiting for us. And so we can't tie our identity to this world when we are loved by God, the God of this universe. Again, huge topic, and we just touched on it. But I hope you see the point. As you counsel, you have to help people understand who they really are. Again, think of stressed out Sally. She must not be defined by her boss's opinions or marital status or financial situation or her successes or, or failures at work. She is defined by who she is in Christ. And the more that she's convinced of that, the more that her stress and her anxiety will go away. All right, C there is um, outward circumstances and people. Um, outward, I'm sorry, outward circumstances and people, a deeper and more practical theology of this world. When we think of theology, we often think of these complicated concepts, um, but really theology is about what you believe about Jesus. A little while back, as a, I think it was last year or the year before, um, we were driving, and my two older boys were talking about how in Bible class, and the Bible teacher is here, Chris Koga, and they needed to write a devotion, okay, that they would have to turn in and get graded, and then give it to the class. Now, I cannot help my kids with a lot of things in school. Art projects, mess, grammar ain't so good, but I can help them with writing devotion, right? I thought, I'm thinking, I got this. So I told them, hey, guys, we're just driving you, It's got to be about Jesus. You, you have to just, you got to get them to Christ. And it's quiet for a moment, and I heard one of my sins, sons, I'm sorry, sins. Um, I would say Freudian, but um, one of my sons turned to his brother, and he said, you know, I'm going to do what Calvin did. And in my mind, I'm thinking, my son is like this young theologian. I mean, he's 12. He's talking about Calvin, tear in my eye, and thinking about all the great things he's going to do for God. And then when his brother didn't understand, he says, you know, like when Calvin said to Hobbes, and I said, that's about right. But again, the point to them is like it has to be about Christ. And this is not just in their devotions, but this is life. Right? And our theology is what we understand about our world, about God, about Christ. And people need to be able to practically apply their theology to their world. I, I learned that often people's problem isn't just bad theology, just an insufficient one. I mean, everyone has a theology and understanding of God in their world, but it is incorrect. if it's incorrect or insufficient, it will affect how they understand and live life. Let me give you some examples of people's theology. Money is security. I need a wife to be happy. There is no joy in serving others. People are a means to love or identity. I am defined by my successes. 
people need to understand, better understand their world. For Sally, we d she doesn't have the right lenses to interpret her world. Um, now, this is a huge topic, but basically comes down to your theology of life. Now, in your notes, I have a theology of suffering and a theology of loving others. Um, but as I was realizing it, um, if I give you those examples, um, you won't get, go home tonight. So um, we're going to come back to those ideas. But I hope you see the bigger picture. We're helping them to understand their world. So, for instance, a theology of suffering teaches them what the Bible says about suffering and how they're supposed to relate to it. So as I'm counseling, getting back to the bigger picture, correcting, building up someone's worldview, as I'm counseling, I'm listening intently to what someone believes. I need to know their faith. And, and then I'm going to use the truths of Scripture to correct and build it up so they can see God themselves and the world rightly. Okay, second point here. We need to, we need to little, hurry a little bit. But we need to encourage and fuel worship, the worship of Christ. So again, we're, we're correcting faith and we're fueling worship. So at this point, you realize one of our goals is to encourage the worship of Christ above all things. How do we do this? We fuel their faith. We fuel their worship. Um, so in your notes, I think it says this. We don't want them to fuel their faith and love of idols. Rather, we help them to fuel their faith and love of God by helping them to know God, the object of their faith and love. We could put it this way. We must provide fuel for the worship of Christ because they will have plenty of fuel to worship their idols. So how do we encourage someone to worship Jesus? We provide them fuel. Um, we remind them of the gospel. We teach them about his greatness and goodness. We show them he is better than their idols. Maybe one simple way to picture it in your head is this way. Imagine in your heart or the heart of those that you're counseling, there are two fires. One is the worship of, and faith in God. The other is worship and faith in, in their idols. The question is, which one will you fuel? We're supposed to fuel our love of Christ. Colossians 3, 1 through 2 says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seated at the right hand, uh, uh, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on the things that are above, not the things that are on earth. So Paul says, set your mind on the things that are above. But he doesn't end there. He says, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. And so do you see the contrast? We are going to set our mind somewhere. By that, he means we will direct our focus, our attention, our faith, our worship. And there's really only two options, the things that are above or the things below. As Paul wrote in Romans 1, the creator or the creation. <coughs> and here he says it must be Christ. So it's not just a looking away, but a, look, a looking to, but it's a looking away. Let me give you some examples. <coughs> Excuse me. If you spend hours mindlessly surfing the internet or taking in social media, or you dwell often on the sins and faults of others, or if you listen to the culture's idea of happiness and rights and values, or if you look at envy at what others have, then you're pouring fuel on the flames of your idolatry until it is raging, this raging, consuming fire that's difficult to put out. On the other hand, if you focus on the truths of God and who he is, his character, what he has done for us in Christ, his promises to you, if you go through the word and let the word go through you, if you focus on the beauty of Christ over the beauty of your idols, if you come back to the gospel every day, then you're pouring fuel on the flames of your faith and love of God so that it becomes the raging fire that consumes your life. And this is so important. If you focus on and dwell upon the greatness and goodness of God, it will fuel your worship. That's why the psalmist says in Psalm 119.11, have, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. It's not just like if I memorize scripture, this, like it's almost magical. It's when the word is the fuel for worship, we don't sin against God. Imagine a firefighter going to a fire and pouring on gasoline. It would be ridiculous, right? Imagine you're counseling someone whose girlfriend broke up with him, and so you say things like, she is such a jerk. She is so selfish. You have every right to be angry. If that were me, I would lose it. What have you done? Poured gasoline on the fire of their idolatry. I understand the problem isn't that they don't have fuel. They have plenty of fuel, and fortunately, it's, it's often the wrong fuel. Again, think about stressed out Sally. She has a lot of fuel for idolatry. <clears throat> Deadlines at work a boss looking over her shoulder, her singleness, her bills, all of those things are fueling her idolatry. So you can imagine she is constantly thinking about them. 
So picture her, and maybe kind of see it as a math problem. Maybe she's thinking about work like 60 hours a week, barely praying, barely reading the word, simply going to church. Maybe 10 minutes of quiet time, church on Sundays, a couple of hours a week thinking about God. On the other hand, 60 plus hours thinking about work, feeding her idolatry. She's going to lose that battle. Now, if you remember in the case study, it says that she was reading Philippians 4, 6, and 7, and it wasn't helping, right? Do not be anxious about anything, but with everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your prayer requests, let your prayer requests be made known to God, and the peace which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. She forgot verse 8, the very next verse. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Right? That's what she needs to do. She needs to fuel her faith. Paul's saying, fuel your faith with what is right and what is good. I think a good example of this is, is bitterness and anger. One thing I've noticed in my life and the life of those that I counsel is that a major danger is dwelling upon the sins and faults of others. So imagine you're doing marital counseling. Imagine you're doing counseling with someone who has, has, has hurt them. What do they do? They think about the sins of others. I think I used this example before, but imagine you, you, your husband says something unkind on the way to work, on the way out the door for work, maybe a sarcastic comment. 10 a.m., that was mean, thinking about it, dwelling upon it. Noon, he never says anything nice. 2 p.m., why can't he be like other husbands? 4 p.m., I don't know if he loves me. And then the husband comes home, and it's kind of this World War Three. So you dwell upon it, you think about it, it begins to feel your worship of your idols, and it gets worse and worse. You've literally meditated on the wrong things. You've done quiet times in bitterness. So what started as a sinful and yet small comment, which probably could have been dealt with, became things like, he doesn't love me. So why is the person so angry? Because they spent their whole day fueling their idolatry. So rather than personal devotions in the word, they do personal devotions in bitterness. And again, it's not that complicated. I think this explains, too, why some sins are so difficult to deal with. Imagine you light a match. It's pretty easy to blow it out, right? Imagine you light a match and you throw it in the middle of a forest and, and the whole forest catches fire. I remember the first time I learned that sometimes these forest fires take months to put out. I was like shocked. Like, how, how is that even possible? But that's what it, like, when it's a raging fire, it's tough to put out. Imagine I've spent months or even years building up this fire in my heart of anger and bitterness. It's probably not going to be blown out in a moment. And so what we need to do is to give more fuel for their worship of God. I remember counseling one couple, and uh, one of them had committed an act of selfishness. It wasn't, it was selfish, but it wasn't marriage-changing selfish. You know, just an act of selfishness. Um, but for the one, they, they could have kind of blown out that match, forgiven, moved on. But they, they dwelt on it literally for years until it became this raging issue um, that, that, that took a long time to deal with because it's like this big fire that they need to put out. One more example. Think about, about pornography. Imagine you're counseling someone struggling with pornography and you ask, well, did you view any pornography this week? And they said, well, in honesty, I, I, I did once near the end of the week. But I want to know more. What was fueling their lust? And you find out they spent hours on the Internet, not looking at something pornographic in the strictest sense, but definitely not definitely those things that were fueling their lust. They're watching hours of primetime drivel. They let their minds wander at the gym as some are dressed less than appropriately. When they lay awake at night, their minds go to lustful thoughts and, and, and that they entertain. Now, on the other hand, they're doing a few minutes of quiet time a day and they go to church. So again, it's kind of like the spiritual math problem. A couple of hours fueling their faith and a couple dozen hours fueling their lust. Should we be surprised that they kind of lost that battle and looked at pornography? So again, part of your job is to help them feel their worship, their worship of Christ. I have two ideas there. Um, we'll come back to this next month when we talk about teaching, but a couple things there. One is correct and build up faith in Christ. So as you probably realize, this is a reiteration of our earlier point. But understand one of the graces of building up someone's faith is they love uh, and worship Jesus more. So the purpose of building someone's faith is not only trust, but love and worship. Second is re redirect idolatrous desires to Christ. We talked about this a couple of sessions ago, 
but at the heart of our worship is desires, and so they need right desires that lead to right worship. And one of the ways that we do this is, is trying to show them that the things that they're seeking in the world are often, are often dangerous substitutes of what they're meant to find in Christ. For example, so often I am seeking security in the world and money in relationships or a job, but true and ultimate security are in Christ. Or, um, so rather than get someone who is stressed over finances a vague idea like, well, Jesus is better than money, I want to tell them why their truest and deepest securities are in Christ. Um, so what I'm thinking about here is that when someone is worshiping, I'm trying to think through their desires. What do they really want? So maybe it's pretty obvious they worship money, but why do they want money? Is it security? That's different than identity. That's different than pleasure. Um, and so I'm trying to think through what, what are the deeper desires behind their worship? Someone who struggles with body image, maybe they seek love that they believe will come if they're more attractive. Maybe someone stressed over finances seeks security and money. Maybe someone who's bitter towards their husband or wife seeks respect or love because they believe that that'll give them meaning. So I'm trying to look at the deeper desires, love, security, meaning, and when I figure that out, I can tell them what it means that in Christ we have all that we seek. And again, with this in mind, we find clear teaching points. So I hope that kind of makes sense. We'll come back to this idea. It's a, I'm, I'm really out of time here. Um, we'll come back to this idea, but basically, again, as I'm thinking through their worship, what they desire, and talking about what it means to find what we, what we truly seek in Christ. Okay. There's more, to come, there's more to think about when it comes to the process of change. So we'll come back to this as we think through the process of counseling. Um, but I hope that this gives you some idea of where to get started in considering what change looks like, how we encourage them to, to repent, to turn from their sins, and to, to turn to Christ in faith and in love and worship. Okay, before we break, we wanted to show a testimony. Uh, since we're kind of moving, transitioning to the process of counseling, we actually wanted to show a testimony from one of our counselors, and the hoping that you might be encouraged... Um, are excited about the opportunity that you have to counsel others, and then maybe it'll ease some of the worries that you have when it comes to counseling. Uh, my name is Annie, and I'm a mom of two girls. I have a 14-year-old and an almost 13-year-old, and we also have a dog. My journey to biblical counseling it started um, nine years ago. Um, I went through a major trial, and like John Piper's Don't Waste Your Cancer, I did not want to waste my testimony. So nine years ago, I went through a divorce, and it was a biblical one, a necessary one, but it was painful, it was hard, it was full of grief and loss and betrayal, and there I was faced with a choice. Uh, would I turn to God or would I turn away from Him? And really, by the mercy of God, I was able to run to Him. And I was counseled by God's Word um, through times of prayer and through Sunday messages and in small group studies, um, I was brought to comfort and hope and just this realization of God's goodness and sovereignty. And this was something that was really good. And with, like, like with anything really good, you have a desire to share that with others. So I had this desire to share my experience of, of realizing God's sovereignty um, with other sisters at church. Um, I wanted to walk with sisters who were going through similar um, trials. And then other people pointed me out to some people and they asked me to walk alongside some sisters. And it was a great joy to me. And I felt kind of called to do so. Then I was able to be a part of um, Lighthouse's first counseling, uh, biblical counseling class. And back then it was really small, like 20 people. And um, as I see the class evolve now, I just see more resources and also more homework. But for those people taking it now, I think that's much better. I mean, the more homework, the more sanctified, for sure. So yes, uh, people are blessed. And um, through going through the class, I just felt better equipped. I felt better equipped to uh, listen to others with humility and with, with um, insight. Um, I was able to know how to access resources and um, just receiving kind of a game plan blueprint from the um, pastors and leaders and just felt more comfortable and more able to um, kind of uh, effectively counsel others. 
Well, I'm a big NBA fan, so I like to use basketball analogies. So that day did arrive for me, um, that day when you know, my number was called and I was brought off the bench and I was put into the game. So I did receive my first formal biblical counseling assignment. Previously, I had walked alongside some sisters in an unofficial kind of um, capacity, just encouraging them while they were receiving biblical counseling. But that day finally arrived for me. And I was excited, but I was also nervous. Um, I didn't want to mess up. And um, my first um, counselee case, I, I read through her PDI, and her main issue was not really in my area of direct experience and expertise. So I wasn't quite sure. I wasn't confident that I could effectively counsel this um, sister in the Lord. Um, another fear was that, um, you know, would I, how would I handle the fine china of the sister's life? Um, I wanted to, you know, be able to give her comfort and listen well, but I also didn't want to accidentally step on things that were, you know, private or made the sister feel more vulnerable. Recently, um, a recent counselee, I, th we, I thought we were dealing with one particular issue and then it went into like an area of spiritual warfare and I, I definitely felt kind of out of my depth. And um, I wanted to make sure I wasn't being unbiblical. I didn't want to, you know, discourage the sister in any way, uh, but I also didn't feel fully equipped at times. Knowing that really it is God who is sovereign and good and if I if I, uh, if in our discussions, if we are talking about how to um, worship rightfully and just what are we treasuring in our hearts and um, if we are using good biblical counseling resources, knowing that and, and if we're constantly starting and ending and going and using scripture to guide us through the process, knowing that that is what is sure and everything else is something that is a little off the mark, but, uh, but starting from scripture and starting from great biblical counseling resources. And also with kind of specialized issues, I was able to turn to the leaders um, of our church, the pastors, the, the main counselors um, in our biblical counseling ministry, and just being able to have conversations with them. And they were able to um, provide me with resources where I could do some study and some prayer. So knowing that I wasn't in it alone by any means, and knowing that I could draw from just a partnership and support from the um, pastors and having access to great resources. Knowing that it is the Word of God and in the Word of God we have God showing His goodness, His sovereignty, His loving kindness care over us and if we, and if we were to seek scripture for like a magic bullet, oh here, here are the five verses that show me how to talk to the sister through this issue, that's not the right way to come to God's Word. It's God who dictates um, the changes he wants in our hearts and knowing that fundamentally it really is an issue of worship. So um, not looking for specialized answers, but looking for the, the main true answer, which is turning our worship to God. To counsel in the church context is to be part of a team, is to not go at it alone, is not having to be a LeBron on the Cavs, carrying the whole team on your back. It really is not like that at all. In fact, it's, it's, it's a privilege to be able to serve in any kind of small capacity. Um, and also, when you're, when, uh, by being in the same church, um, the counselee and I, we have more of a complete like 360 context. When she talks about who she's in accountability with, which small group she's in, and what they're studying, I know these things as well because I'm going through the same things. When she talks about which ministries that she's currently serving in. Um, also, we're often, we're often reflecting back on you know, that Sunday's message and um, the small group study. So it's a great way to not just have this isolated weekly counseling session, but to really be conversing and praying and discussing things through the context of the church life. And also it's great because I find myself just, the, the fellowship with these sisters just continues to grow. Uh, recently at, at the women's retreat, I found, myself, I found myself in the same small group with um, a former counselee. And then another counselee joined the um, kindergarten first grade children's ministry team on which I currently serve. Another counselee goes on short term missions pretty regularly and I continue to receive her prayer and support letters. So it's a great way to just have that fellowship extend and grow. Through going through um, biblical, the biblical counseling class and just serving as a counselor, I think I've just come to a deeper understanding and knowledge that all sin is rooted in worship. Like, are we worshiping rightly or are we worshiping uh, wrongfully? 
Um, also, in terms of whatever issues I may be going through or somebody else may be going through, that we need to see like what we're treasuring in our hearts and that any kind of fruit that comes out from in our lives, good and bad, are really the result of what we are treasuring. So I think just having a firmer foundation and, and understanding and looking through life through the lens of worship and the way that I, I talk to people and the way that I listen to others and the way that I receive encouragement and support from others, like that is what we keep on um, coming to. I'm in an accountability group with two other sisters and, and we're all moms and we all have daughters actually. And what sometimes our conversations begin with, I'm so frustrated, my daughters aren't listening to me, it's so hard. And really what ends up coming out is, um, you know, what have I been seeking that I'm not receiving? Um, am I seeing my daughters as God's daughters first and I'm the steward? And my first and foremost responsibility is to uh, trust in the Lord and be led by the Lord in counseling my daughters. And through that process, it sometimes leads to, I need to not speak as much. I need to pray more. Other times it's, it's easier to not say anything, but I really need to, you know, have a sit down conversation with my daughters because this is a way to be a faithful steward. And ultimately it's about being hopeful, not being discouraged, knowing that it's the Lord who is in charge. And so it's not how my daughters, you know, come to know the Lord in a fuller or um, how they ultimately respond to various issues in their lives. It's not up to me, it's up to the Lord. And my job is to trust in the Lord and lead them accordingly. I would say like prepare to be blessed. Um, something I found through biblical counseling is that it's just another chance to study God's word. So meeting on a weekly basis with a counselee I do feel like I am more blessed than I'm being a blessing. I get to go through a great biblical counseling resource. I have the opportunity to depend on the Lord and pray for this sister and have the sister praying for me often as well. And it's a chance to see how God works in people's lives in this very direct, hands-on, and sometimes this very specific manner. And it's uh, like we've heard in at Lighthouse's counseling ministry, it is having that court side seat to see God's work of redemption and change and bringing someone to hope. Um, so it's, a, it's been a blessing. And I think that everyone will experience that. And I'm really excited to be kind of kicking off this next portion of our training, which is getting into the process of counseling. So I don't know if you noticed, if you noticed there was... Uh, Pastor Kim wrapped up the, the process of change, and so it's at like part three. This is the process of counseling, part one. And those are the kind of the two big questions we ask as we walk with people. How do I understand someone, and then how do I help them? And so we really wrapped up that first question. How do I understand a person, how they work, how their heart works? And now we're moving into, now how do I walk with them? How do I help them? What do I do? What do I say? And I want to start by just kind of giving us an overview of the process of counseling before we go in depth. Basically, what we're hoping to set before you today or tonight and for the next few sessions is not a magical formula for the process of counseling, but a framework of hope that allows your counselee to come for counseling and encounter Christ. The four aspects of a counseling relationship, you could call this the, the four ways to give hope, is love, know, speak, do. And you might have seen that that is kind of the way Paul Tripp describes the process of counseling in your reading and in Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands. We say this is a, a, a four aspects of a counseling relationship, four ways to give hope, because these actions incarnate Christ into a ministry relationship. So every aspect should give hope. Yeah, hope is not a tag that you stick on at the end. Um, hope is not just a caboose in a counseling conversation. It's not just a prayer you put in there. Hope is not a periscope. I think it can be treated this way, but hope is not a, a periscope to escape life by mentally checking out. All right, hope, hope looks into the dark waters that you're facing through the light of the gospel, and it believes Christ has been through these waters. Hope says not only has Christ been through these waters, he's familiar with them, he's sovereign over these waters, and, and he's with me right now showing me how these dark waters are designed for my good 
and he promises to stay with me as I go through them. Like, so hope in Christ is everything. It's not, hope is not avoiding the dark waters. It's not changing the subject. It's not just going to your happy place. It's seeing all of reality through the lens of Christ. Who he is, how he is with me, what he has been through. So let's take a look at each part of this framework for hope. First is love. Love, and here we're understanding relationships as the context for change. In order for someone to change, they need a relationship. In Scripture, change always takes place in the context of a relationship, in the context of a committed relationship, a covenant. God comes and makes a covenant with us, commits to us, takes us as his people, and changes us. Understanding how he works in this relationship opens our eyes to see that our relationship with him is not a luxury, but a necessity. And that's how we need to understand our relationship with each other, not luxuries, but necessities. As Paul Tripp says, these are not shelters for human happiness. These are workshops for sanctification. It is only in the context of the process of genuine change to take place. It's only in the context of relationships that genuine change can take place. And in the same way, Christ wants us to build strong and godly relationships with each other, just like we do with him. God's purpose for our relationships, as I said, is to be his workshops. So really to love someone else is to first love God and accept God's purposes for that relationship. So a love, when we're walking with someone, love allows us to see a person, not a problem. Love checks my heart and asks me, what is motivating my counsel? Love purifies our interactions from being bent and twisted by other agendas. Love is our preparatory attitude in counseling, and love is the guardrails for all we do when we're walking with someone. So we're going to talk a lot about that first aspect in the process of counseling tonight, love. But love is important for us to learn in how to build relationships that let God's work of change thrive. It is God's work of change housed into the relationships in the church. Second is no. Understanding the heart provides that friendship and direction. And this is where we go deeper in understanding others. And in the love, no, speak, do, just by the way, there will be lots of overlap. So this is a kind of helpful categories for us to distinguish certain things. But no is where we go deeper in understanding. Think about the people you are closest to. How well do you know them? I mean, maybe you know them really well in all the right ways. But I think a lot of times we can just kind of be on the surface. We can know facts about them. We can know who their spouse is, where they work, their likes, their dislikes. But often we don't understand the person. Our relationships are often trapped in the casual. And because of this, our opportunities to minister are effectively limited. So knowing a person means knowing their heart. In your reading, you saw Paul Tripp said, when I say I'm getting to know you better, I'm not gaining a more intimate understanding of your kneecap. I'm growing to know more about your beliefs, your goals, your hopes and dreams, your values and desires. He said, if I know you well, I, I should be able to predict not only what you will think, but how you will respond in any given situation. Because I'll have a good understanding of your worldview, what's important to you. As you get to know the counselee, a relationship, a friendship forms that allows you to really connect your hearts. So there's, there's so many wonderful things about just that know, that relationship, that building understanding. It's more than just gathering data. It is it's building that relationship. Third is speak. Personally sharing the hope of Christ. This is the moment. Speak. When we minister God's truth to the person within their situation. So to prepare for that moment where we're speaking, we are loving, we are listening, we're studying so well that we not only know what to say, but we know how to say it to this person in the midst of what they're facing. Truth can never be watered down and must never be changed. It must never be compromised to make fe people feel better. Sometimes we think it ought to be, or we, th we think we must mask truth or hide it because of what someone is going through. But it simply needs to be, and I say simply, it needs to be positioned in a person's life very carefully so they can cling to it. Now, of course, we can share wrong information. We can give bad counsel. I think Job is a good example of this. 
Job lost everything. He lost his crops, his livestock, his servants, and his children. Yet it was his counselors that were his greatest trial, his greatest torment. The the book of Job has two chapters on Job's losses and then over 30 chapters of torture from his counselors. Counselors can either be the greatest help in a person's life or their greatest tormentor. And it's sobering. So I prepare for speaking by asking, what does God want this person to see that they're not seeing? How can I help them see it? We speak truth that helps people see their life clearly um, because it helps them see God clearly. I like how John Piper says, as ministers of the gospel, we are artists. Our job is to paint the beauty of Christ in vivid terms. We cannot control if people will think he is beautiful. Our job is to display his beauty. So when we speak as counselors, we never stand against the person, but alongside them, pointing out the things God wants them to see, believe, confess, and forsake. Last is do. That's that fourth step in our process of counseling. Training up hearers and doers of, the wor- of, of God's word. We must finally help the person do something with the truth they've heard. If you've ushered someone into a greater delight, a greater worship of God, greater love for Christ, if you've seen the Spirit grant someone insight into Scripture, hope in Christ, then you've witnessed something marvelous, the beginning of change. But that is the beginning of change. The the light of the glory of God that they have seen in the pages of Scripture now will change how they live in their situation. So they need help thinking through practical, personal ways to live differently in order to enjoy this God that they're getting to know better, that they've maybe just met, and and show him to others in their life. So those are the the four main aspects that we're going to be talking about in in the process of counseling. Love, know, speak, do. Finally, I just want to say this model of counseling, love, know, speak, do, it's not just a framework for hope in the counseling ministry. (laughs) but it's a lifestyle God really calls everyone in the church to be living. It's what fellowship should just do when relationships are set free from the casual to discuss the heart. We're called to be life-changing instruments of grace all the time in every relationship. The, The lifestyle will work in the formal counseling office in your church and the informal and in the informal counseling conversations with Christian friends who just are in need. You can even adapt love, no, speak, do to a five-minute conversation on a Sunday after church. Like for example, here's a potential like conversation after church. Let's say you you see your friend and you ask them, "How are you doing?" and they just decide in that moment they're going to be honest with you. And maybe they're convicted. Um, from the sermon or something, and they say, you know, brother, sister, I hate my job. I really, that's what I've been thinking about. Every day feels like torture. I just live for the weekend at this point. Well, love, no, speak, do. So we'll start with love. Love would enter their world and say, I'm so sorry. I know you've been at this job for a while, and it, it definitely wasn't like this when it started. What, what changed? And they might say, well, there's a new boss who makes us all stay late. And then I've got these coworkers who just give me their work. Well, then no wants to deepen that understanding. So you say, well, when you get discouraged at work, what gives you hope? How do you make it through the day? They might say, well, you know, I probably need a better hope. I just think about getting a new job or getting to the weekend or one of my coworkers getting fired. So then we're maybe come to speak and say, you know, brother, sister, I, I, think, you're, I think you're right. I, I think God wants more hope for you on a Monday morning than maybe someday you'll have a new job or someday difficult people will leave. I mean, if Christ can look at the cross with hope and joy and, and pursue it for our sake, according to Hebrews 12, I, I'm sure there is a hope God wants for you as you go to work each day, that that's better than the weekend or a job change. And then do. It, can we just spend some time studying hope in Scripture this week and, and praying together? Can I give you a call tonight after dinner? Can I pray with you right now? 
So immediately I'm, I'm taking steps with them toward Christ. I'm, I'm wanting to plan times of following up. I'm wanting to deepen the conversation. It's easy, I think, for us to hit a ceiling after love and no, right? We just get the information and then it's like, I'll be praying for you. Like this is, this is when I'm going to step away, right? But what would it take to, to lean in and say, like, what are the steps we can take toward Christ together? And if you don't feel comfortable in that five-minute conversation, keep that relationship going. Keep that topic going. Pray and say, I'd like to talk about this more. I'd like to pray about this. We're scared often to go further, but we need to. And we need to take relationships toward Christ. Not just the surface of them, every part of that relationship toward Christ. So think now, where has God positioned you to have those kinds of conversations? Who are the people in your life he wants you to have them with? I hope this, this, this training is not just like, well, I hope that, uh, I hope in this training that you're not thinking, well, maybe I'm hoping that at the end of all of this training, I can start to counsel people. I, I truly believe that this is a ministry that already exists in every single one of your lives in some form. And this, this training will hopefully allow you to do it better, but please don't wait. Walk with people, love them, bear burdens, pray. All right, let's look at love, this first aspect in the process of change. The first point under love is God's love must shape our lives. And one, there's three questions we can kind of ask to evaluate if God's love is shaping our lives First is, we become what we behold, so how do you see God's love toward you? We become what we behold, so how do you see God's love toward you? God's love must shape our lives because we become what we behold. So how would you describe God's love in your life? What, what are you beholding? Is it loving and redemptive and hope-filled and restoring and compassionate and honest and faithful and eternal? I, mean, I know Pastor Kim talked about the doctrine of God's love is like this huge pool that is infinite and will go on for eternity, ever deepening. And we're kind of like tiptoes in the shallow end here on earth right now in understanding his love. But how do you understand his love in your life? And is the way you would describe his love, is that how others would describe your love? Is that how they would describe their relationship with you? 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is spirit. So we become what we behold. So the question is, how do you see God's love? Do you see his love as, as a tangible and recognizable form? Is it present in your life, rich? Is it practical? Because if God is a deity who sits in heaven, vaguely interested in your life, who keeps himself pretty detached and aloof, you and I might love similarly if that is our view of God. If I believe that God, that Jesus was sent to do something for me historically, and he will do something again for me in eternity, but his present activities are just shrouded in mystery, then I will love with a puny, impoverished view of God's love that will feel irrelevant to just daily life. For, I, I'll keep my distance. I'll neglect to pray. I'll avoid building deeper understanding. I won't look forward to meeting with people. I'll stay on the surface. The way we love is a reflection, is an overflow of our conscious awareness of the love of God that we have received. So the first priority in learning to love well is to be sure that you are enjoying your Heavenly Father's love as a real, vibrant, and relevant part of your life so that God's love is reflected in your counsel. So how should you see God's love for you? So the first question, how do you see God's love? Second question, how should you see God's love for you? The Hebrew word for God's faithful, promise-filled, covenant love is chesed. Paul Miller, in his book, A Loving Life, says that chesed combines commitment with sacrifice. It is a one-way love, love without an exit strategy. When you love with chesed love, you bind yourself to the object of your love, no matter what the response is. 
So if the object of your love snaps at you, argues with you, is in a bad mood, Hesed love is you still love them. Hesed is the opposite of the spirit of our age, which says that we must act on our feelings. It says, we'd, Hesed says, we don't act on our feelings. We act on our commitments. That displays the faithful, committed love from God we've received. And our commitments last because God's love for us does not come to an end. We love because he loved us. We keep loving because he keeps loving us. Our commitments endure because God's commitment to love us never wavers. Why is Hesed love important? Because sins and sufferings come and go, hopes rise and fall, pressures go up and down, emotions and feelings can change in minutes. But words and actions of commitment reveal a solid relational foundation that goes down for miles into the depths of the love of God. If that's your love for them, for that person, they will have hope. Hope that your love isn't going anywhere, isn't going to change. Hope that your counseling relationship, your friendship, your marriage is is founded on Christ. So God will transform people not only through what we say, but also through the way we display the love God has shown to us and to them. So maybe they lashed out in anger at us when we were meeting up with them over coffee. If I text them and say, when can we meet up again? Right? I am showing a committed love. I'm going to move toward you. I'm going to love in the face of wrong. That will be, I think, part of how God can transform them. You are showing them Christ. We want to incarnate his love in the relationships he has given us. We are not just to be conduits of God's truth. We are also the evidence of his truth. So what do people see when they look at your life? when they see your relationships, when they see your response to difficulty. They see Christ. Remember that the most important encounter in ministry is not the person's encounter with us, but their encounter with Christ. So we must ask, does my life incarnate the love of Christ? And that's the third question. Does my life incarnate the love of Christ? Your relationship with Jesus will overflow into your daily life whether you are aware of it or not. So here are some questions to help you evaluate. Simply, here are some practical questions. How are your spiritual disciplines? Time in the Word, time in prayer. Are they personal times? Do you enjoy God? Second, are you able to communicate the gospel personally? Is the gospel for you, does it feel like this really dry, boring, like humdrum thing that you have memorized? Or is it personal? Is it meaningful, impacting the way you see your world? Third, how are you growing in your own battle with sin? Can you identify sin in your life? And do you ask for help? Are you excited about ministering God's grace because you are so thankful for the grace you have received for your own battles and struggles that day? Fourth, are you growing in the way you turn to Jesus in the midst of suffering and hardship? Your ministry will come out of all of these things. All of these will help you lean into the love of God so that you will have his love for others. When gospel, hesed love disappears, counseling is a clanging gong and a banging cymbal. And as ambassadors, God uses us not only through what we say, but through who we are and what we do. Brothers and sisters, we're not just speakers. We are real, living, flesh and blood illustrations of God's love to that person we are with. We are evidence that God loves them. So practically, what does that mean? Here are some practical suggestions for demonstrating our Savior's love. Number one is say no to counseling opportunities. Now, I don't know about everyone in this room, but I would say typically people who enjoy counseling really like people being pe- in people's lives and, and maybe like saying yes to people. <laughs> uh, yes, I will meet with you and have coffee with you. Yes. Okay, yes, that's important. I'm going to meet with you. Yes, yes. All right. My encouragement with that is, if that's you, meet with fewer people so you can love better. Just as a shepherd cannot watch over an endless number of sheep, 
You cannot form loving and wise counseling relationships with an endless number of people and and remain faithful in that. For each counseling case, I, I recommend to our counselors, think of two or three hours of outside prep work and communication with that counselee per week. And I, we don't have to call him a counselee. You can call him your discipler. You can call him your child, your spouse. But the, the, thing, the, the times of just fellowship we want to prepare for, we want to pray over, we want to think about, we want to reflect on. So say no to counseling opportunities so you can say yes more to the people who are already in your life. Number two, pray more. Before you meet, after you meet, before sending emails, after sending emails, before assigning heart work, after assigning heart work, pray. If God answered prayer, even in a small way, just stop this session right there and pray. I Thank you, God. This, you have been so merciful to this couple or to this brother, to this sister. Make a big deal out of that. I can't have too many tangents here, but I think people in counseling, their eyes are just so overwhelmed with need, with the struggle in their life, with the suffering that surrounds them. They need us to help them have eyes to see grace so we can stop and pray. Number three, guard your heart from favoritism or partiality. Leviticus 19, 15, don't be partial to the poor and defer to the great. Now, this, is, this has been one of the prayer requests I've asked for a lot when, when brothers ask me for prayer or how they can pray for me because there, it is easier to love certain people I meet with more than others. Like they, they do their homework. I see real evidence of humility and growth, and this person is stubborn. They don't let me talk. They're very hard to deal with, right? Do I love them less? Will I love them less? Paul Tripp, in his book, War of Words, calls favoritism passive hatred. He says, this heart reflects self-love and anger against those who have not pleased us or satisfied our desires. Our hearts toward a counselee, or maybe toward all counselees, can be shaped by our selfish expectations rather than the joy of sharing the glories of Christ. There is no higher calling, but we can hold Christ back through our favoritism. Fourth, seek forgiveness. If you acted toward your counselee out of anger or impatience, then repent. There can be humility for us as counselors as well. If resentment is growing, then they will not encounter Christ. They will encounter your sin. And after you repent, you can remind them, I I really don't approach ministry from a position of confidence in myself encouraging you to be like me. I I come in weakness with my own indwelling sin. I want to be your sibling in the faith to lead you to the only one who has strength and deliverance to offer both of us. So even those times where we maybe sin against our counseling, that we say something unkindly or disrespectfully, we are selfish, um, we can ask for forgiveness and and remember that we're sinners too. And that can move them to see, wow, this is a partnership. This is what it's about. Number five, cancel a session. If you're not looking forward to meeting with a particular person, stop and ask why. Seek repentance and counsel for your own heart. If it's not a crisis session, consider canceling and rescheduling. Talk to your supervisor um, or or your pastor. Unlike other jobs, you can't just kind of, I'm just going to suck it up and speak the truth and love to this person. You just can't do that, right? Right? Because that's not Christ, and, and they need to encounter Christ when they're with us. Maybe you're like, oh, it's been a long day, but I've got to keep this commitment. I'm so angry right now, but I've got to keep this commitment. No, like, cancel the session. And you can, you can explain why I'm struggling in my heart, and I want to be in the right place to love you well. Number six, always be growing in your understanding of God's love. I think, you know, as all these personal improvement projects are going on, If we're honest, we could all do a personal improvement project on knowing God's love and sharing it better. Number seven, imitate those that love well. So find people who are just clear flesh and blood pictures of the love of Christ and spend time with them. Find out why uh, find out what they are doing to enjoy the love of Christ and, and the different ways they think through showing it to others. In other words, be discipled in this area of loving well. 
Not only must God's love shape our lives, but secondly, God's love must shape how we enter the person's world. And to help illustrate this, I want us just to do a little walk through of, of kind of God's entry gate into Elijah's life in 1 Kings 19. There is no better way to understand how to love a person than to see the way Christ works in our own lives to change us. I mean, think about how Christ entered your world. Think of your testimony. Like, who are the people that brought, that brought Christ's love to you and kept bringing it to you? Who lived God's love toward you? Who spoke the gospel to you? I think 1 Kings 19 is one of the most beautiful stories of God's love as the entry gate to his counsel. So he, in, in 1 Kings 19, Elijah the prophet runs away from his mission and enters the wilderness. He's fearing for his life because of Jezebel's threat to kill him. And he says, it is enough, O Lord, take my life. I'm no better than my father's. So Elijah, he's terrified, he's suicidal, he's sad, he's hopeless, he feels like a failure. So how does God enter his world? Well, an angel is sent who touches him and gives him food. And it, it says, cakes baked on hot stones and a jug of water. I love, love how like literal and specific it is. <clears throat> it's like Narnia food. Cakes baked on hot stones and a jug of water. So before a word is said, there's a compassionate touch and a physical need met. Then God does the same thing again. A touch from an angel, food, and then the angel says, get up, you need your, or, get up and eat, you need your strength. Then God asks Elijah some questions. What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah says, the people of Israel <clears throat> have killed all your prophets and only I am left. And then God gives hope. He says, there are 7,000 in Israel who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. So you see how God entered his world? A touch of a friend, a hot meal, loving questions, and strengthening hope. Right? That's how God encouraged Elijah and, Elijah and helped him return to his mission. Right? He didn't come as a rebel. Or, he, didn't just see as a re, he didn't just see him as a rebel or a sinner. He sees a faithful man who was tired and scared and hopeless and hungry. So he sees and enters, enters enti his entire world. And I also, <clears throat> I mean, if I was to imagine how I would counsel Elijah, I would be thinking, I need to point to God's sufficiency, Right? When he says, I'm the only one left, I would say, God is enough. God is enough. And I think God was aware of, you know, I think Job needs a statistic. I mean, I think Elijah needs a statistic. I, need I think he needs reality here. He's not alone. There are other relationships out there. I think that's encouraging to me that God knows Elijah so well. He knows exactly the kind of truth he needs to hear in that moment. There are 7,000 others. So in counseling, I, I, I want to move toward them as God moved toward me, as he moved toward Elijah. I want to establish a relationship. I'm entering their world, not just their problem. As Tripp says, I'm not popping the hood on a broken down part of their life. I'm entering their broken world and listening because I truly want to love as I've been loved. So I, I anticipate so much more than seeing sin. I, I anticipate building a relationship and seeing God's gracious redemption unfold. Um, the, the phrase Paul Tripp uses for starting point um, in building a relationship is entry gate. And he lists specific examples of entry gate questions. But I want to think through what these entry gates would look like in both informal and formal settings. Because this class is not just about what you would do in a formal counseling ministry. It's about how you speak in all of life, how we build relationships. So here are some informal entry gates. So this is, I put next to that, locating their story. Because in the counseling ministry, they're just going to come to you to tell you their story. How do I enter a relationship where someone is not just going to tell me their story? How do I kind of locate their story? This is where you're moving towards someone. They're not approaching you. You could be wanting to go deeper with a friend, wanting your child or grandkid to open up, wanting to grow a better understanding of your spouse. So how can you move toward them and hear their story? Here's a few things. First, be tangible. Can you observe their world and look for avenues to love practically? Maybe at the beginning of the relationship, 
you're asking, how do I get to their story? So just practically, what are their needs? Like Elijah, do they need food, groceries, meals, fruit from your garden? What about child care? Do they need a respite night? Do they need, what do they need? Can you watch their kids? Do they need transportation? Are there expenses? Can you alleviate a need? Can the church help? Be tangible. Do you see their whole world? Not just the points of struggle spiritually. Uh, secondly, be, be personal. So the compassion for a parent's suffering. Are you aware of sickness in their family, loss? Have there been any major changes or transitions in life lately? Share your life. Talk about the Dodgers or new restaurants you like. Share life as friends. Don't be afraid that you can only talk about this really serious, heavy stuff. You can just enjoy life with them. Find out what matters. What are the important parts of life for them? Can you find out their treasures? And regularly follow up. Keep track of this person's story. If you're wanting to locate their story, are you texting them? Are you asking them how they're doing? And Are you telling them this is how you're praying for them? So first, be tangible. Second, be personal. Third, be humble. Self-disclose. Can you speak about your own story, your own struggles? Can they see how Christ is working in your life? Can you have a demeanor that says, I am here and nowhere else? That's important. You have a demeanor that says, I am affected by the things you share, whether that's weeping with you, rejoicing with you. Whatever it is, I want to walk with you with an emphasis on with you in this. I'm not coming in as an outsider. I'm walking with you. So this is some informal entry gates as we try to locate the story. Here's some formal entry gates. So someone who's coming to you to share their burden with you, to share their story. Informal counseling, there's a real danger of skipping over being personal when this happens. We can skip all that relationship love, all those tangible demonstrations of care because they're just going to tell me their their life and I don't have to work that hard at building a relationship. It's just kind of their life is going to be dropped into my lap. They're going to answer my questions. They're going to come in and tell me everything because they want help. But that doesn't mean we minimize the relationship. We still must build the relationship and love well. Here are some examples of Intrigate questions. I want to start with my favorite This is my go-to when I'm not sure what to ask. Are there any questions you're wrestling with right now? Are there any questions you're, any other questions you're wrestling with? Last month, I I spoke for a retreat, and one of the things I did was I did a workshop on the gospel and same-sex attraction, and a student came up to me afterwards, and he just wanted to sit and talk. He waited until everybody was out of the room, and then he shared with me that he struggled with same-sex attraction. He's in high school, a ninth grader, and he told me that he'd never told anyone before. And then he, there was just this silence. And I thanked him for telling me that he would honor me and be so humble and honest. And, and after just sitting with him for a moment, I just asked him, like, what are some of the questions going on in your mind right now? And he shared about how he's scared to tell anyone. And in particularly, he was scared to tell his mom. And so I asked him, like, what are some of the concerns there? So I'm, I'm basically just taking that question, what are the questions on your mind? Because rather than just giving him questions, I want to see what are all the points where he has questions. Now he's just trying to begin to put together a puzzle. There's something very big happening for him. So this, this question, this first entry gate, I think is very valuable, and especially in informal settings, because maybe they don't even know how to process things. So just saying, what are the questions on your mind kind of forces them to ask a question, maybe to think through something. Second, uh, uh, entry gate question that's for- more formal. When did this start? So they're sharing their burden. You're asking, when did this start? Three, can you remember a time when it wasn't like this? What kinds of things come to mind when you think about this family member? So let's talk, like they're getting specific. What are you afraid will happen when you see them? How would you like to be praying for this relationship? How have you found hope in the past regarding this relationship? And what kinds of thoughts eat away at your hope? So I think all those, those questions are, are there. Then evaluate your questions. What are your questions like as a counselor? 
And I, I think this is something I'm always trying to highlight for our counselors. I shouldn't say always. I'm trying to do a better job of highlighting for our counselors is growing in our understanding of our strengths and weaknesses as a counselors. So what are my questions doing? <clears throat> Number one, do my questions guide and teach? Do they open eyes and, and help us examine our hearts? Do they help us see? Do they guide and teach? When we get to the, the speak portion, and we'll go into specific types of questions like that. Secondly, do my questions show my weakness? So if someone says something that doesn't make sense to you, you can ask about that. You can say, you know, I, didn't, I don't think I understood that completely. Right? You don't have to kind of try to keep this front of I'm kind of completely understanding everything you're saying all the time. It's good to follow up and say, can you explain that some more? I really want to make sure I'm understanding you well. So do my questions show weakness? Three, do I already know the answers to most of my questions? Do my questions feel like a seventh grade math test? Our, our questions should not mimic giving a quiz. They should help you explore. I would say try to avoid questions you know the answers to. Explore with people. Walk with them. Fourth, do my questions focus too much on facts? Right? If you ask too many factual questions, you will miss the person, right? How, how many siblings did you say you had? And what, um, what exactly did your wife say? And what, um, what did he actually say? I, <clears throat> so we don't want to get lost in the, the facts are important, but we want to see the person. We want to see their worldview. Number five, do my questions come in rapid succession? Kind of like an interrogation, Right? I would encourage you to avoid rapid-fire questions so they don't feel like they're in a courtroom. Again, imagine you're just sitting with your friend. How would you like them to walk with you? Six, do your questions get to the heart? <clears throat> Am I learning about this person's faith, desires, worship? Are the questions helping them connect the dots between their heart and their life? So you see, even the way we ask questions is a demonstration of love or can hold back love. Then as they start to answer questions, I would encourage you to scan three areas as you listen. So here, I'm going to give you these three categories to kind of scan for as they start to share with you. I mean, <clears throat> what do you normally hear in a conversation? Are you wanting to know more about this person? I want to suggest these three areas. First, listen for the good. The person in front of you reflects uh, the image of God. So can you... Can you see the work of the Spirit? Can you see the fingerprints of their Creator? Before we go looking for sin, are we on the lookout for grace? 1 Corinthians 1, Paul starts with thankfulness for the testimony of Christ that is among the Corinthian church. And they're entrenched in deep sin. But he starts by the good, pointing to the good. Second, listen for the hard. The person in front of you suffers. So can you pick up on the troubles they're facing? We'll talk more about this in a, a few minutes if we have time. But for yourself, do you know how to love those who suffer? Right, do, when someone's talking about their suffering, do you feel like you have to give an answer? Do you feel compelled to give advice when someone's just sharing their suffering? Yeah, how do you handle people's trouble with care? Third, listen for the bad. The person sins. So what do you do when someone confesses sin to you? In, in counseling, you'd say, I, I am blessed that you would tell me this. Now, how can we move forward together? How can I walk with you through this? So all of these areas of listening are ways we scan for relationships. Right? As believers, we relate with each other on these three levels, saint, sufferer, and sinner. Th this way of listening should help you connect and be personal because you see yourself. All of us in this room, as if we are believers, we are a person who reflects Christ, but we are also a person who is weak and struggling in the, in the darkness of this world and the sufferings, and we're also sinners. And that's me. That's my life. So I want you to think of now like day-to-day -day entry gates. Let's say your friend Sally comes to you on a Sunday after church and just asks that you would pray for her. She's stressed and mentions that work has been crazy. She's been going to spend time with her parents and she has a hard time loving them because they always nag her about being single. What are the entry gate questions you would ask Sally? So we don't have much time here, but I want to give you just maybe one minute to pair up with someone and just 
ask, discuss in pairs. So one person be the counselor, one person kind of play Sally, I guess, or Sam, okay? And the other person be the counselor. And then ask entry gate questions for one minute and then switch roles. And this is just to help us practice asking these kind of entry gate questions, informal, formal entry gate questions. So let's just take a minute and then we'll do another minute and switch. So practice asking entry gate questions with someone. All right, now take one minute and give feedback. I'm so sorry, I know it's so short. One minute, give feedback, talk about, talk about what entry gate questions were helpful. Okay, now switch places and have the other person ask the entry gate questions. Now take one minute and give feedback to the person. Talk about what entry gates were, questions were helpful. All right, thank you guys so much for participating in this activity. I feel like we uh, could develop a new ministry if we keep practicing this, like speed counseling. Yeah. Okay. Okay, sorry, I gotta talk about crisis entry gates, otherwise you're not gonna know how to talk to someone in a crisis. All right. Okay, so crisis entry gates. Um, the example that Tripp gave you of the woman who was married for 15 years she had three children, and she calls you after being abandoned by her husband. I would put that example that Tripp gave you in the category of a crisis entry gate. 
Now, that happens, um, especially as pastors. If you're he- pastors who are here, you know that you get those kinds of phone calls. I've gotten phone calls from women in almost the exact situation a handful of times. So it's good to be ready for a crisis moment when it comes. Um, this is not gospel, but just a suggestion for how to approach someone who is in a crisis. So number one, discern the entry gate carefully. So if it's a real crisis phone call or face-to-face session, you have to discern that entry gate. Before asking lots of introspective questions, it might be good to offer words of comfort or just to weep with them, saying, I'm so sorry, just to sit with them. Second, maybe ask one or two entry gate questions. So once you discern what has happened, you've wept with them, consider asking one or two questions. Questions like my favorite, what questions are going through your mind right now? I mean, what's, what's going on right now for you? What are you thinking about? Number three, ask yes or no questions. So if I'm asking them entry gate questions like, what, are, what questions are going through your mind right now? They might say, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. Th- if they say that, I would stop and wait, maybe move to yes or no questions to offer help. So like, can I call someone for you? Can I pray for you? Can I make you some coffee? Can, can I read Psalm 46 for us? You know, can I take, would you please let me take care of getting babysitters for your kids tomorrow, organizing everything that you're going to need? Can I take care of, for, of that right now for you? That might need to come before the entry gate questions, just depend, depending on the crisis and the situation, if they, how they want you to relate to them in that moment. So it takes discernment. So ask yes or no questions, right? Then I would say talk them through the next day. Give them something to do, right? Your parents are flying in. The Smiths are going to go pick them up. We've got meals covered for your family. Are you okay with the kids' schedules tomorrow? Do you need me to call and cancel anything? Take them anywhere, right? I think that would be probably more loving than just asking lots of questions to, can I, can I come alongside you in very, very practical ways right now in this moment of crisis? And fourth, give them concrete truth. They need concrete truth, solid joy, right? To remember the gospel, to remember that single anchor of hope that they have in Christ. Um, kind of one passage that I, I go to for this is, is Hosea 6.3. Um, if you didn't feel comfortable reading that to them, you could just say, can I pray a passage of scripture with you right now? And, and just pray the scripture. Take some of the themes of the passage and let it draw your prayer to Christ. But Hosea 6.3 says, Um, Let us know and let us press on to know the Lord for his going forth is as certain as the dawn and he will come again like the rain, like the spring rain watering the earth. And that in the midst of all the uncertainty that we're seeing in the situation, Father, we know that you are the one certain thing and we want to press on to know you in this moment because you are our hope. So remind them of that concrete anchor. Maybe walk them through Psalm 23, maybe something very familiar, and show them familiar comforting truths, uh, maybe in a new light, in a way that allows them to really personalize it. A few years ago, I, I talked to a woman just hours after her husband had committed adultery, and I asked her some of those entry gate questions, and she said, yeah, Tim, I don't know. So I asked her those yes or no questions, and she said, Tim, I need counseling. I need homework. I need a game plan. I need my relationship with God to be solid if I'm going to make it through this. So my entry gate for her was just to speak truth, to actually counsel her. We walked through Psalm 23, and I had her just think through what the presence of God means in in the valley. So whether you're looking to start informal conversations or if someone is coming to you for help in a crisis, we need to think carefully about putting love front and center. And that is why wise questions are so important. Entry gate questions are vital. But they're vital, most of all, because this is the model we have in God. This is how God approaches people. When Adam and Eve rebelled and hid, the omniscient God of the universe, who knows everything, came. Not with accusations and lightning bolts, but with questions. Where are you, Adam? Who told you that you were naked? Did you eat of the tree? When Elijah ran from Jezebel and was praying for God to kill him, God sent him an angel with food and asked questions. He didn't come with demands or sarcasm. 
He entered his world with compassion and questions. It's how God comes to Jonah. It's how Jesus comes to his disciples again and again. Therefore, if we're modeling God's love in these questions, then the main goal for us is not simply getting lots of information, although that's incredibly useful since we're not God and we don't know everything. Um, Asking questions is primarily about showing our focus is not on what they have done or what has happened to them. Our primary focus is not the situation, it is them, their experience in the midst of the situation. Number three, God's love must help us identify with suffering. God's love must help us identify with suffering. So how do we do this? How do I identify with those who are hurting? This is still part of this love in the process of counseling. How do you identify those who are hurting in your church and in your community? How do you, how do you know when someone's hurting? I think this is where shepherding and discipleship and outreach relationships are so important. We need to already be linked into each other's lives before those waves of sorrow come. Even someone who seems to have it all together, how do you find out where they're hurting, what their prayer requests are? Look for those who are hurting. Secondly, draw near. You must draw near. Compassion requires proximity. Jesus healed people when he saw the crowds, when he was close to them. He sees suffering and responds personally. So Jesus did not like, point to a map and say, I want to heal all of Jerusalem. I mean, he could have done that, but he wanted to be among them. He wanted proximity. He walked among them. He touched them. He talked to them, not because he needed to, but because that is how he loves. The, the proximity also communicates that they, your time is theirs. You're not in a hurry. Proximity helps us not only encourage community around those who hurt, it helps the community move toward them. If someone is hurting, what is better? What is better? To remind them, you need to keep going to church even though you're in pain. Or to have people from church personally reach out to them and love them in tangible ways. We want to enter their world. This is non-negotiable. We, we don't step around tragedies like the Levite and the priest did to the man who was beaten up in Luke 10. Right? We are good Samaritans. We must be. We see someone hurting, we draw near. We pray, we care. If someone has just found out they have cancer, you don't jump to, well, be sure to keep glorifying God because when trials come, we're tempted to sin. You jump to, and you don't jump to, well, count it all joy because James 1 commands you to take joy from your trials. There's a lot of wrong things about both of those statements I said, but you want to enter their world and learn their current needs. Given this diagnosis, brother, sister, what are the changes that are just coming at you? How can I be with you in the midst of this? What plans are you making And, and do you need help with that? What expenses are you incurring? Can the church help? So many people respond to suffering with great, you know, anger and pain and kind of Job 6.26, we kind of use the word wind words, right? Job 6.26, the words of someone in pain belong to the wind. But these are some of the sample phrases I've heard from people who are suffering. I just want to read these to you. It's the five of them. Pastor Tim, God answered my prayer the wrong way. I prayed for healing and he did not heal. Or, will I ever be happy again? Or, I'm angry with God and I don't even know how to turn it off. He's taken everything away from me. I've been in situations where a counselee starts accusing people in the church of not helping and not doing enough. They're in pain, they're suffering. I've heard someone say, why would God allow this? I can't do this when they're battling disease. So are we prepared to hear these things from our brothers and sisters? How would you draw near? What would you say to those questions, to those statements? These are all sound bites I've encountered of people who are overwhelmed and they're starting to lose hope in the face of suffering as we all do when major parts of our life feel like they're falling away. 
Johnny Erickson Tata said that if suffering is splashes of hell into your life, right, tastes of, of torment from that horrific eternity into this life, then what are splashes over of heaven? Is it when the pain goes away? Is it when the chemo doesn't feel bad? Is it when you can rest longer and the skies are blue? Johnny said, it's when you find Christ in your sufferings. That's the splash of heaven. And I believe that one of the most important ways people see Christ in their sufferings is through the church. It's through people um, who come to share burdens with thankful hearts. I mean, that's, that's what compassion means. I know you guys know what it means. Come means with. Passion means suffering. We don't just give them help like they've walked up to our counseling counter and we're giving them some prescription. Right? We help them with partner, partnering, reminding them how essential they are, how that by sharing their burdens, they're not taking away, they're contributing we don't let them completely isolate themselves. We draw near. As shepherds, we must draw near. Why? The only thing that will get them through this is seeing Christ. And the most important way for them to see him is as the family of Christ draws near. This, I believe, is the most important part. Perhaps more important than speaking. When pain comes Um, I believe faithfully displaying Christ's love comes through seeing suffering and drawing near. Okay, so we draw near. Next, speak words of hope. Speak words of hope. <clears throat> I'm going to go just a little bit over tonight. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Once we have recognized suffering and have drawn near, the next step is to say something possibly, if it's appropriate. I don't think you always need to, especially when the wound is fresh. Because of our relationship with God, when we hear suffering, we don't try to squeeze it into a nutshell and summarize, assuming we understand. We don't command people to be happy. When we see suffering, we see the birthmark of our family. And we speak in a way that moves us together toward the cross to find hope. Here, are, there are so many ways to speak words of hope. Here are three samples. First, connect suffering with a longing for home. Romans 8, 18 through 25. Right? In those verses, there is a longing for home that Paul says we share with all creation, and his metaphor is labor pains. His picture of all creation is, creation is like this pregnant woman delivering a baby, and that baby is the glorious reunion we are going to have with Christ. And the significance of her pain is, is nothing in comparison with the incomparable glory that's to come. And so our groan for redemption takes all the agony we experience and uses it to help us organize our hope around not what is seen, not the significance of the pain, but around what is unseen. If the pain is this significant, how incomparable must the glory be? Second, connect suffering with the health of the church. Ecclesiastes 7.2. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Often we see, we feel like an unnecessary burden to the church when we are suffering. But our personal burdens and struggles, when we share them with others, can actually contribute to the growing hope of the church. As the church leans on Christ with us, they will discover how strong a Savior he truly is. Because they're sharing with us in the midst of our suffering. I heard at a conference one time a pastor say um, to, the, to the speaker, I think, uh, it was John Piper, and he said, what should I do if I have no suffering in my life? What should I do? And I would have told this man, I, Piper answered really well, but I would have also told this man, come around the people in your church who are suffering. Groan with them. If he, Ecclesiastes 7, 2, it's better to live there in the house of feasting, you will remember how dependent you are on Christ in light of eternity. Third, connect suffering to Christ. Galatians 3.13, while our sorrow and struggles do help us look forward to completed redemption, they should also help us look back to the man of sorrows, to Christ, and remember what he had to experience for our sake. 
as we persevere under the curse, we must remember that Christ became a curse for us in order that we might have that hope of redemption. Now, I want to quickly go through this. What not to say to someone who's suffering? What would maybe rob someone of hope, debilitate them, hurt them? Think of a trial you've been through in life. What did people say that was helpful? And what did people say that hurt? Often when I ask this question, people have like all these ways people had hurt them with bad counsel. And it's really hard for them to think of helpful counsel that they heard in the midst of suffering. Before we go through this, though, I I just want to note that what is helpful and meaningful to one person may be unwanted or even annoying to someone else, and there are no one-size-fits-all words or deeds of love. So uh, the relationship itself, I think, brings the most significance, right, to what is being said. Okay, what not to say list. First, don't be silent. Our suffering can essentially... Uh, excuse me, our silence can essentially deny another person's suffering and loss. The two most common excuses people use to avoid speaking when someone is suffering is, I don't know them very well, and I don't know what to say. And so my suggestion is, if, if you don't know them very well and you don't know what to say, go up to them, if you know they're hurting, and say, you know, I know we don't know each other very well, and I honestly, I don't know what to say, but I want to let you know I'm praying for you. (laughs) <laughs> that all means so much to them. So don't be silent. Second, don't have a face or body language that communicates kind of maybe a detached analysis or confusion or boredom. Be aware of your body language. If you're one of those people who, when they, when they eat, they kind of get this angry face that they don't, right? Just be aware of what your face is doing, what your body is doing. <clears throat> Third, don't ask potentially painful questions. For example, if your friend's son committed suicide, and you would not ask specific details about the death, right? Um, how, how did he do it? You wouldn't ask that. Fourth, common things that are probably unhelpful. And I get this from uh, Nancy Guthrie's book, What Grieving People Wish You Knew About and What Really Helps. I highly recommend it. Nancy Guthrie, What Grieving People Wish You Knew About and What Really Helps. So don't say these things. I know just how you feel. Oh, you'll be fine. You can always have more children. She lost four. And someone said that to her. You can always have more. Well, at least, anything that comes after that, do not say, well, at least, dot, dot, dot. Um, Don't you think it's time to move on? I guess God just needed him in heaven more than we needed him here. I just know God is going to heal you. God just wants you to be happy. Um, next, don't offer corrections in the face of suffering. Someone is, Job's wife said to her husband, why don't you curse God and die? And, you know, if you look at Job's life, he had these children who were godly, who feared the Lord. At the end of his life, he has children once again who are godly and who fear the Lord. And I think his wife, who is also at the end of the story, had something to do with that discipleship. So I'm not going to hold her hostage to that one phrase she said after all of her children had died. Those are wind words spoken out of great suffering. So we don't offer corrections. We're very careful with the way we offer corrections if we offer corrections in the face of suffering. Um, I heard of a missionary couple. They weren't set, sent on the mission field because the mission agency said, well, you have not gone through the Kubler-Ross stage of anger when you lost your child. So because of that, because we didn't see you get angry enough over this loss, we're not gonna, we don't think you're fit to serve. Right? So another thing you wouldn't say in the face of loss or suffering. Number seven, what is the other side of the story? You know, so, well, Proverbs 18, 17, you know, says that well, as soon as one person shares their story, there's a whole other side of the story. So you're telling me you're suffering, but what about the other people in your life? Maybe they're the ones who are really suffering. Okay, how should we use Proverbs 18, 17? I, I, it belongs to judges and criminal investigations. It's, it's helpful to know all sides of a story when we're kind of making a final declaration. I, I don't think it belongs in ministry to people who are suffering. I would define suffering as the stuff that hurts. If they're hurting, weep with them, be with them, don't correct them. 
initially. Um, walk with them. Number eight, forgive and, uh, uh, okay, this is terrible, but forgive and forget in, in the face of someone maybe who's gone through great abuse or who's been raped. Just, you need to just forgive and forget. So that's what not to say. What to say, you can refer back to this words of hope from earlier. Um, after the death of a loved one, share positive memories about a person who died with those who are mourning. In, in Guthrie's book, she emphasizes communicating the value of the person who is lost, who was lost to the individual who is grieving. You know, um, in the face of loss, leave a message, send a note, mark your calendar to remember the anniversary of a death. Call or text them on that day a year later. Pray, show up, be there, be slow to speak, be quick to listen. Pray with them. Humbly approach God with them. Name the difficulties they're facing before his throne. Rehearse the hope of the gospel in that prayer. And lastly, think, can you tell a Christ-centered story of your own suffering? Now, remember, in, in the effort to share your story is not to try to match someone's other, someone else's story, like to say, I, I completely understand that you're, because, you know, I know your daughter passed away and I had a family member that passed away like 20 years ago and it was hard, right? That can communicate self-centeredness, insensitivity, it can belittle their pain. Rather, share your story um, along the way, later on in the journey, maybe not in the near loss, but when you're in the midst of talking about hope so that you aren't just matching their pain, but you're sharing hope and you're sharing in their hope. The story should not lift, or not only lift their hopes, but cultivate a deep thankfulness. Sharing your story is the final purpose of suffering. It reveals that your suffering, um, that through your suffering, God did not only do something in you and for you, but he is doing something through you. Right? We all have stories of suffering, and those are important to steward well so we can bring comfort to those who um, need to experience the comfort of God. So today, several of you turned in the personal story of comfort project. But one of the encouragements in chapter 8 of Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands is to tell a story that is old enough for you to reflect on how the Lord brought comfort in the middle of it. Tell a story that is old enough for you to reflect on how the Lord brought comfort in the middle of it and how he used it and how he used people to do it. So how did God do his work of change in you through loving relationships? And you might be part of that story for someone else. So first, we would see that our relationship with God guides how we enter a person's world. Second, it allows us to incarnate the love of his son. And third, our relationship with God helps us identify with great suffering. Thank you, guys. Please consider what is at the stake. What is at stake if you counsel without love? You will present Christ without a, with, with a crown and not a cross. He'll be a lion and not a lamb that was slain. The way we move toward people will either proclaim Christ or hide him. And in counseling people, people need to come face to face with the love of Christ before anything else good can happen. Uh, this love is not about being nice or benignly tolerating sin. Love is active. God wants us to be his agents of rescue when others fall into sin or lose their way in suffering. And if God chose to expose someone's struggle to you, he wants you to respond with his self-sacrificing, committing, redemptive love.